Good morning, everyone. This session's uh, recognizing the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory 50th anniversary, 50 years of science and service to society. Our first speaker is the lab director, Dr. Debbie Lee. Thank you. And everyone who contributed to GLORAL successfully carrying out its mission. I'd especially like to thank our invited guest speakers, some who have come from quite a distance to be here today with us. So the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory has been committed to protecting and securing Great Lakes water and ecosystem resources for the past 50 years. And I'm looking forward to the laboratory doing so for the current and the next and future generations. Uh, today, my talk will focus on GLORAL scientific contributions, there are many people I would have loved to highlight and recognize who made those contributions, but our time is too short today, so I'll be focusing on our highlights of our science. Following my talk, Dave Reed will talk about the origin and growth and struggles of the laboratories in its first 25 years. So GLORAL's mission has evolved uh, since its inception to meet the needs of science in the Great Lakes. Although it was established in 1974, GLORAL has deep origins that relate all the way back to the U.S. Lake Survey in 1841. The Lake Survey was originally established with the goal of surveying the Great Lakes. By 1901, Lake Survey's mission was expanded to include studies on water levels, river flows, and diversions, data that would later be important to meeting the U.S. obligations under the 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty. When NOAA was established in 1970 by executive order, the functions of Lake Survey were transferred to NOAA from 1974 through 1976. And GLORAL was established in 1974 from the International Field Year of the Great Lakes Project Office in Rockville, Maryland, and the Limnology and Computer Divisions of Lake Survey in Detroit. And since its inception, GLORAL has been shaped by the earlier need to have a fundamental understanding of the lake's hydrology and the subsequent need to address emerging issues related to water quality and ecosystem health and restoration due to past industrial degradation. So my presentation today is going to focus on the evolution of our major science programs and each of GLORAL's core competencies as shown here. And it will touch upon a few highlights that show GLORAL's leadership in Great Lakes research. Okay, thank you. Many of the topics I'll mention today will be discussed in detail by our colleagues throughout the next two days. So GLORAL's research has always been underpinned by our research infrastructure, and that research infrastructure has grown over time to meet our needs. Shown here is our first research vessel, the Shenehorn. Upon its establishment, Laura was located in two buildings in Washtenaw Avenue in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and the Marine Instrumentation Lab on Felt Street in Ann Arbor. By 1987, there was a need to consolidate the facility with improved capabilities, and GLORAL moved into its new laboratory building on 2205 Commonwealth Boulevard, shown here in the upper right corner. And then by 1989, the Cooperative Institute for Limnology and Ecosystems Research, or SILER, which was the forerunner to our current Cooperative Institute for Great Lakes Research, uh, was established with an agreement signed by the University of Michigan and Michigan State University presidents and the NOAA administrator. In 1990, GLORAL assumed ownership of the former Coast Guard base at Muskegon, Michigan, and established our Lake Michigan Field Station. The site included three buildings and research vessel dockage, and the Shanahan was relocated from Grand Haven to Muskegon. And by 1993, building modifications and renovations were completed to include scientific laboratories, offices, and storage. And today, we're in our second um, renovation and updating of our field station. And then in 1992, GLORA was connected to the internet for the first time. And by 94, our first website was online. And still growing, we had a need again for additional facilities and we moved into a new building custom designed for the laboratory on State Road uh, in 2010, 
with more square footage, improved laboratory facilities, marine instrumentation storage, and staging areas and conference room space. So our on the water research required research vessels and our vessel supports our integrated scientific research for NOAA and our external partners. We initially acquired the 65 foot Shanahan from the Army Corps in 1974 and it was originally home ported on Lake Erie in Monroe, Michigan. But by 1982, we, meant we transferred it to Grand Haven and that effectively placed a priority on Lake Michigan research. With the establishment in the field station, the Shanahan was moved to Muskegon. And then in, a need of, in need of additional vessels in 2002, uh, we acquired the 80 foot research vessel Laurentian from the University of Michigan. Uh, we leased it at that time. And then we purchased it outright in 2015. And I have to say that was the best bargain I ever made. We purchased it on a credit card for $3,000. So um, in 2007, uh, we received the White House Closing the Circle Award. Uh, that recognized our initiative to convert our research vessels from petroleum-based to bio-based fuel and lubricants. It was the first initiative of its kind, and it was soon followed by the Army Corps doing similarly. But between seven, 1975 and today, uh, to meet our expanding on the water research uh, capability on multiple lakes, we, we have now today acquired a fleet of 17 purpose-specific vessels including the Laurentian and ranging in feet from 25 to 80 feet with hydrographic surveying capability, buoy tendering, AUV deployment, physical and chemical and biological sampling. And we retired the Shanahan in 2010. So converting our real world, world, real world observations to data is what supports our studies and, and our assessments. So in addition to our fleet, we've been collecting observations and data through a variety of, sort of techniques. And these techniques include direct biological sampling, satellite remote sensing, in-situ sensors, observing systems, and autonomous vehicles. So some of the highlights of our observing systems are shown here. Um, Early in 1984, we began deployment of bottom resting observations to monitor sediment resuspension and transport. By 1990, we established the NOAA Coast Watch node for the Great Lakes, and we calibrated satellite derived water surface temperature data against water temperature data from our NOAA weather buoys. In 1998, we installed our first webcam at the field station, and by 2000, we'd established several coastal real time meteorological stations to improve lake circulation modeling and to provide data to the public via the internet. And in 2014, we acquired the first freshwater multiple opening, multiple opening and closing net in environmental sensing system, uh, affectionately called the MOCNES. And today we have new technologies, including acoustic Doppler current, current profilers, micro cinematography, a plankton survey system, and uncrewed underwater surface and aerial systems. I'd like to highlight our Recon Coastal Observing Network, which provides advanced data, a collection from buoys, underwater hubs, fixed structures, and coastal locations. It was developed to provide a low cost coastal uh, capability for seabed to sea surface observations. And the system is designed to add buoy observation sites to meet regional integrated observing system requirements. And we use this system to collect long-term data sets for physical, biological, chemical, and meteorological parameters in the Great Lakes. And in addition, the project makes relevant data accessible to the public and educational institutions. And Steve Ruberg will talk more about this tomorrow during his presentation, but I wanted to highlight the importance of the development of this observing system. Let me also highlight the Great Lakes Coast Watch, which delivers satellite derived environmental data and products for near real time observations in the Great Lakes. As I mentioned, uh, in 1990, NOAA established uh, the Great Lakes node as part of a nation nationwide initiative. And we use this for ocean and coastal applications and it supports our ecological forecasting, monitoring of algal blooms, tracking sediment plumes and studying temperatures and effects on fish populations and more. 
In 2017, just to highlight one product, we developed the ICON product, which pro provides information on ice formation and the types of ice in the Great Lakes. This is used extensively by the US Coast Guard who relies on it for ice breaking operations and ship transit assistance. And in 2023, we presented a new website design and functionality and we're adding new projects yearly. Uh, George Leskovich will discuss the history of Coast Watch and Andrea Vanderwood uh, will talk more about the current features of Coast Watch in a later session. And GLORAL now continues Lake Survey's mission of working to understand lake levels, river flows, and ice cover through our hydrology program. We support Great Lakes water management in a number of important ways. NOAA has key participation on the Great Lakes Basic Hydraulic and Hydraulic Data Coordinating Committee, and we also have a seat on the Great Lakes Adaptive Management Committee with the International Joint Commission. We've provided historical research and development of models used by the boards of control through a unique research to operations partnership with the US Army Corps of Engineers Detroit District and GLORAL. For example, we develop and provide the models and data products that are heavily relied upon by the Army Corps to produce their seasonal water level bulletin. Early in the 1970s, GLORAL has set the stage for understanding and predicting Great Lakes water levels with simulations of water levels back to the mid 1800s. In the 1980s, GLORAL became the leader in hydrologic modeling of the Great Lakes watershed runoff, lake evaporation, lake thermodynamics, and over lake precipitation that led to the development of methods required for seasonal to interannual water level forecasts, long-term monitoring of the components of the Nut Basin supply, and water management activities in the lakes. By the 1990s, GLORAL transitioned the Great Lakes Water Resources Forecasting System to numerous users, including the Army Corps, the New York Power Authority, and the Midwest Climate Center. In the 2000s, GLORAL took leadership in establishing the Great Lakes Evaporation Network, a network of eddy covariance and meteorological stations to directly measure lake evaporation. And today, GLORAL's received $3.86 million of bipartisan infrastructure law funding to advance the modeling beyond the current season and water level forecasts. You'll hear more about that effort today from Lauren Fry. Another important activity has been the digitization of ice databases that allows researchers to observe long-term changes in ice cover as a result of climate change. In 1970s, we still had hand-drawn maps on paper, and today we have fully digitized GIS-based maps of ice cover, ice concentration, and ice type. And you'll hear more about this today from James Kessler. And the database feeds our work to model and forecast ice, and Gia Wang will talk about this program over the years. Our lake hydrodynamic studies in the 1970s through the 1990s resulted in design and calibration of a Great Lakes forecasting system that provided wind, wave, and temperature forecasts for the Great Lakes and simulated lake levels and flows and paved the way for our ecosystem and oil spill modeling. By 1992, Routine operation of the experimental Great Lakes Coastal Forecast System began and then transitioned to operations in 2010 as the Great Lakes Operational Forecast System run by our National Ocean Service. Today, with over 30 years of development, the Great Lakes Operational Forecasting System includes hydrodynamic models aimed at providing improved predictions of water levels, ice formation, and movement, water currents, and te water temperatures for commercial, recreation, and emergency response communities. And today, the third generation of the system has a resolution of 200 meters to two and a half kilometers and produces forecasts 120 hours into the future. And Dave Schwab will go into much more detail about the evolution of the Great Lakes Coastal Forecast System shortly. GLORAL's work in understanding the dynamics of the Great Lakes ecosystem established a foundation for new concepts, models, and forecasting tools. Through the 1970s and 80s, nutrient enrichment and lake eutrophication studies provided realistic targets for point sources of phosphorus and models that supported reductions recommended by the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Persistent organic contaminant studies resulted in a spill model 
to determine short-term immediate movement of, oil, of oils and hazardous materials. And equally important, our long-term observations and research produced crucial data sets that informed resource managers on how the ecosystem was changing over time, including the impacts of invasive species. NOAA Glural's long-term research approach integrates a core set of long-term observations on biological, chemical, and physical variables, along with experiments to explain ecosystem changes. And this information has established a foundation for the development of new concepts, models, and forecasting tools to explore the impacts of various stressors, including the invasive species. And the analysis of historical data provides insight into current decision-making, enables us to identify and address emerging issues. As early as 1975, Glural hosted a workshop on priority Great Lakes research initiatives, and this identified gaps in our knowledge and deficiencies related to nearshore processes and exchange processes, including the lakes in the land, the lakes in the atmosphere, lakes in, and the sediments. And the nearshore was expected to be the most variable and have the greatest anthropogenic influence. And as early as 1979, we had developed a multi-layer ecological model that uh, was applied to Lake Ontario. And by 1992, we developed a functional model of major components of the Lake Ontario ecosystem, including nutrients, pH, alkalinity, benthos biomass, phytoplankton, and zooplankton. And one of our key initiatives was the 1997 NOAA and NSF Episodic Events Great Lakes Experiment, where we demonstrated the importance of winter storms to contaminant cycling, nutrient cycling, and food web dynamics. Gloro has also led the way in studying the impact of invasive species on food webs and water quality. In 1989, we launched a small research project on non-indigenous species. And the research started with the ecosystem impacts of Bithotrephes, the spiny water flea, which had spread through the Great Lakes. However, the discovery of, discovery of the zebra mussels in Lake St. Clair and the passage of the Non-Indigenous Aquatic Nuisance Prevention and Control Act of 1990 Glora was tasked with developing a major program on non-indigenous species, focusing on the ecosystem and environmental effects of the zebra mussel. And today, Glora's experimental work on invasive, invasive dry seeded mussels expanded in the 1990s, focusing on feeding growth, nutrient excretion, and other processes to help explain the mussels' impacts on Great Lakes food webs. And now the understanding gained from these studies is used by resource managers to inform decisions that support coastal infrastructure and economically important fisheries. And now we're facing new challenges, harmful algal blooms, hypoxia, and a warming climate. And algal blooms have caused, caused by excess nutrients were one of the major environmental issues in the 1970s. And at that time, Glural developed phosphorus model was used by the International Joint Commission to determine loading limits. So unfortunately, the issue had returned uh, as recent, more recently, and Glural scientists led some of the early work in identifying and evaluating the processes affecting uh, the deposition and cycling of contaminants in the lakes that showed the sediment zone as a major repository for contaminants and also a major source for recycling contaminants in the water column and food web. And over the next two days, you'll hear more about our work on HABs, rising water temperature, and other key indicators of a changing climate. But for now, I'll just focus on some recent work as it related to harmful algal blooms. Thank you. So. Glural's response to the 2014 Toledo water crisis set the stage for advancements in observing systems, modeling, and forecasting. And our HABs field monitoring and buoy and sensor data was crucial in the development of the tools to measure uh, toxins and predict bloom size and movement. And in 2015, Glural began hyperspectral flyovers of Lake Erie, and in 2017, implemented the first ever freshwater environmental sample processor. And we produced the first experimental harmful algal bloom forecast system in 2014 to 2019, and it transitioned to operations in NOS by 2020. You'll hear from Reagan Herrera today about the advancement in our harmful algal blooms, and you'll hear from Greg Dick on the application of omics, a new technology, to tackle this challenging problem.
So I'd like to invite you to join us for the rest of today and tomorrow to hear more about what we've been working on over the past 50 years and what we're working on now and how we're collaborating toward addressing the needs of a changing climate. Thank you so much for helping us to celebrate our 50th anniversary.